<laughs> What's the most expensive uh, sneaker you've seen? Oh, most expensive sneaker that I've physically seen is uh, something that we had at the store for a little bit, which was this um, Sotheby's auctioned LV Air Force One. Wow. Um, How much we, was that? Like 300K. Yeah, no, I've walked in the Rolex store in like sweatpants and hoodies and they won't even talk to me. I, that, I, I love not looking the part and, yeah. and then being the part. <laughs> not, a, not a boasting statement, but I hoard. And, you know, I 31, 31 time pieces in two years. Damn. Welcome back to the Digital Social Hour, guys. Have an amazing guest for you today, JC Lopez. How's it going, bud? Doing well, man. It was Thank good you seeing you. Me. Yeah, it's good seeing you last night. I've been in the store like three times before I even knew you owned it. So thanks for having me at your store. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I mean, I'm, I'm just glad you had a little bit of time to justify a visit or two or three. Um, that place is, uh, it's really hard to explain to the people that aren't into sneakers, but when they walk in, it's like the yeah. same reaction emotion it's it's it never gets old to see it's it's a real blessing man. yeah man i felt like a kid in a candy store <laughs> cop some yeezys for me and my girl it was a fun time man you got a lot nice. of cool bear bricks in there yeah we you know we've done we we kind of went away from just sneakers right it was like we're looking at this space and in, in the urban space and we're like what are the needs mm. and that's really kind of subjective right and as the brand has grown and and we've been able to attach a few more layers it's really going in tons of different directions from food from you know grooming uh, tattooing yeah art it's clothing it's it's just been a lot of fun of saying yeah that makes sense and then trying to piece it all together right yeah so you guys had like an upstairs is that where yeah so was? uh i'm assuming you went to our caesar's palace yeah. location right so that used to be a gap and uh it's about eighteen thousand square feet and and you know, when we had the opportunity or started having the conversations with Caesars, we were pre in a previous mall here on the strip and we were they're like, hey, we want you to come over. What does that look like? And I was like, well, we're pretty happy where we're at. But if we could try X, Y, Z, then, you know, we're we're down to have a couple conversations. And they were yeah. very open to this new what seems like a new iteration to retail, but it's really just a shop and shop and shop and it just makes a lot of sense when yeah. you walk the space it's awesome i've seen your video on your sneaker collection it might have been the biggest collection i've ever seen um you know uh hoarders hoard man. <laughs> you know like i it i uh this whole sneaker thing it, i've just enjoyed the chase yeah not just with sneakers but with a bunch of different things and um you know as your as your dream starts becoming a business as your passion project starts getting all these layers that require responsibility, mm -hmm. um, you start shedding and then downsizing and upgrading and downsizing yeah. and upgrades. Um, if it's a video that I think, I'm nowhere near that amount. I think anymore. you had like a million dollars in sneakers, something crazy. Yeah, we've shot way past that, but with oh, a lot man. less shoes. Jeez. But no, nah, uh, I got lucky with a few. Yeah. Say that. What's the most expensive uh, sneaker you've seen? Oh, most expensive sneaker that I've physically seen is uh, something that we had at the store for a little bit, which was the um, Sotheby's auctioned LV Air Force One. Wow. Um, How much we, was that? Like 300K. Yeah, but it's, you know, when you're looking at sneakers and you're like, well, wait a minute, who's paying 300? Why did this get to that number? Like, you're looking at it with just like it's, like the purpose of what a shoe is, right? You're mm -hmm. supposed to wear it. So you're like, why would I spend 300 grand on something that I'm gonna beat? Whereas it's more like, uh, it's more like an archival piece that you 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 just put up as art. But there's some people that they're they're hoarding and they're collecting, like they could justify the wear, right? right? And 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 wearing something of that magnitude creates an emotion that's really hard to explain <laughs> very few people understand you're just so you know? protective of not getting them dirty right uh, some people don't even care man. oh really you know like yeah i mean like my what i consider my holy of holies right like the ones that i'm like i still can't believe i paid what i paid like it's at its highest peak and i still wear it and i don't i don't even bother to clean them wow. like i think that's part of 
there's no right or wrong with sneakers, right? It's just you have to have an appreciation, and and most of it is just a tie on tie in into the chase yeah. and the stories behind the chase and your the why, right? right. That's really the what memory. I think. That's why I think sneakers now more than ever is all mo- all walks of life. Yeah. And I don't know much about like the the business side of things, but do sneakers in general hold their value pretty well? Great question. I mean, um, if you if you do the research and you know you tie it to the right story or you're at the right moment and you you acquired at the right time, mm-hmm. yeah, most of most of what you could purchase from any of our locations, if you allow a little bit of time to season and you don't wear them, they go up and wow. a lot of times with the ones that you buy at the store, if you wear them even seven, eight months from now, sometimes even less time, they go up or at least are still worth what you paid even though you wore it. Wow. So um, it's it's like wearable stock in that sense. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's almost like an asset. Uh, well, I've treated everything in my store like an <laughs> asset because it really kind of is. Yeah. You know, I've, um, I don't know how much of my my story and background on how we started, but you know that that location, um, we got a little bit of love with from the from the property to to kind of build out. But I was building that store during the middle of a pandemic. Everything you're paying a premium, expedited fees. Nothing was happening in the time frame that you were expecting, and then right. next thing you know, your cost is triple. Jeez. And so you know the way my bank account is set up, you have to kind of let go of some of the stuff and. When I shed a lot of my personal collection and funded the build out of that store, and that store cost millions of dollars to build. Yeah, that's crazy. So you took a huge risk building that out. Uh, not, not calculated. I mean, it's kind of easier to take those risks that, like, for most, will be like, "Yo, this guy's crazy." Yeah, yeah. When you know that, like, it, I mean, you ten x your money on on an on an asset. You, you're you're hoarding the asset, understanding that at some point it has to serve a greater good, right? right? And for me, it's always been the rainy day fund, mm. you know. So yeah, I got a lot in the rainy day fund. And you also had that personal brand to fall back on. You spent years building that in the sneaker. Community. We've worked really hard to make it inclusive, yeah. Right, and um, you know, you know, without like boring you with the story. At one point, I really felt, and I still feel that. Um, that what this brand like is focused on and all it cares about is like community, mm. right? And and that's all walks of life. And, you know, it started on a kitchen table and now it's in Caesar's Palace and Saudi Arabia and all these other places, but it's with focusing on, hey, here's, the, here's what you came in for, but this is really what you're going to support mm. at the end of the day. And building that brand and that sweat equity has really helped kind of get in those rooms and yeah. get these opportunities that for most like you you don't even know where to start on right. how to unravel how did this even get to where it's at yeah you really emphasize the community i saw you at sneaker con people were just approaching you and it was really cool to see that you still give love to everyone no i mean because i know what it's like being that guy the dreamer that wants to do something and you're trying to articulate it to your friends your family your your close ones and like because they don't understand why you're so passionate about something like it's demoralizing when they criticize it and the criticism you receive it in some cases it's it's more like because you haven't done enough and not necessarily because they don't want to see you do it it's just you're you're talking about something that how do you explain the tangible yeah it's really hard to do right so i know the impact of having a conversation with someone in, in front of you that gets what you're into and is proof of like if you stick to it mm. it could it could work out for you right right and so i try really hard to be a good ambassador for the for for my space for for our community not just here in vegas but globally yeah that's right? i've done over 170 shows Jeez. globally and i've made it a point to travel like I try to go to all the stores that I hear are doing it right wow. or trying to do it right or just opened up so I could understand what their best business practices are so I could share mine because mm. it makes, you know, like everything, no matter how good your idea is, you probably got it from somebody else or thought you could do it better than someone else. Wow. So I've been very fortunate to kind of like learn 
um, on a global scale and then teach on a global scale. It's been a lot of fun. That's cool to see that because a lot of people would see other sneaker stores as competition and not even walk in there. That, that, why? <laughs> I mean, no matter no matter what you do, no matter how hard you go, no matter how efficient you are, no matter how many resources you have, you're never going to win everybody over. Mm. I mean, like you and I could be in the same exact room, same exact resources, same exact people, try for the same exact thing. Guess what? One of us isn't going to get the opportunity. Mm. And it's not because you went about it the wrong way. They might just not like the fact that my voice sounds the way that my voice or my eye goes this way. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I... I get frustrated when I hear people say it doesn't have anything to do with luck because it, to an extent, it does. Sure. Like you could be doing everything right and still not get the opportunity. And yeah. you could be in the right room that could possibly give you that opportunity. But because it's not your time, you don't get it. Mm. And that moment could st like because you didn't get it at that moment, it could stop you from going. Mm. Right. So like, um, I don't know, man, I look at a lot of stuff business i i don't really care for the I, I love scaling i love trying to make it more efficient i've you know i could i could sit here and boast numbers with the best of them um but that's not really what drives me mm. at all it's more about the teaching and helping people be more efficient wow and you mentioned earlier people thought you were crazy when you were starting out did you have any support system at all or were you solo the first few years um well you know to tell you my story in the shortest form possible right like uh when i moved to vegas my first six months i was homeless and i slept in parks i ate out of trash cans i panhandled i stood in line for stuff when i couldn't sneak into hotels i would shower in the fountains in front of caesar's in on days like today where there's like heat advisory warnings i would jump in i would i would go to the properties on the strip that generated the most foot traffic to get out of the heat but also to learn mm. retail like it's so intriguing it's all walks of life the city's like narnia in a sense right yeah. like everybody's here but nobody's here and like if you go to one property you don't really go to the other property and there was like a few properties in the city that like i really had a lot of fun even though i was like kind of trying to save myself but I, I had a lot of fun just people watching and learning and like caesars won me over from day one even mm. though i didn't win caesars over from the beginning and so you go from showering in the fountains in front of it to another point you're working all up and down the place right at all the retail locations that are in there from you know from sony back in the day to apple to nike to you know george jensen when it was there and then mm. now uh i have one of the highest foot traffic stores in that place it's um it's Crazy. really weird man but a, what a, a real journey. blessing what a i'm journey, just man. getting started yeah i love that attitude man and you said you're in saudi arabia too yeah so this started on a kitchen table one shoe 40 bucks Jeez. i've been september of mark nine years that i've been selling sh uh shoes through the brand um at this point i've touched through the brand we've moved over four million pairs of sneakers um i uh i started in the hood mall went to the good mall now i'm in the great mall <laughs> i have two locations in caesars i have a, a a great relationship with some friends that i met through the store when no one cared about my brand uh now in saudi and that's gonna i think it's gonna get a couple more layers attached to it and and you know we're kind of scouring the earth trying to find new friends to kind of be the right ambassadors for the brand and continue to scale it i, I definitely wow. think like this is the smallest iteration that anybody will see of my brand that's insane yeah, it's a real do blessing you, do you worry about scaling too quickly like you saw what happened with cookies does that worry you at all um scaling fat i don't think we're scaling fast enough hmm. um you know what you have to understand is what i'm learning is that you got to make sacrifices in the growing right so you mentioned a great brand that I have a lot of friends of and I have a liking to. Um, you know, you have to make it, you have to water it down as you grow. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you don't care. It's just that it's too many moving parts. So you got to make it more efficient. You got to make it repetitive. You got to make it safe. And sometimes in doing that, as you grow a brand, you kind of lose your cool, right. right? And Or you're so used to seeing it and you're so good at it that it just becomes like bland, mm. right? So um, am I concerned about with that with my brand? Yeah, there's days where I think about it like that, but 
I also know that like my purpose is more to to standardize the industry and I have to be okay with some of the things that like I might not necessarily run that way but the majority of my message is going to come across and it's going to be for a greater good in nice. the industry. I think I change not just sneaker retail, I think I change retail in general with the experiences and formats and processes that were implemented. Wow. So what do you do differently from like just regular sneaker stores? Um, well, the entire store is QR code based. It's right. been like that for about eight years. Yeah, that made it so easy. Yeah, See what um, size is I really am not a fan of walking into a retail location, regardless of price point in a retail location where you want something, you need something. How about now? Right. And then based off of what I think you may or may not have as far as the sales rep like is what determines your your sales experience mm. right i've always much more been a fan of like look these items that you're here for you're you're here for because you're assuming i have them they're the holy of holies you don't see them every day mm -hmm. and i want you to see touch and feel them and for me more it's my concern is that my staff treats you like a family member they haven't seen in you know 10 or 15 years mm. and that they become kind of like that liaison that walks you through gracefully like through this museum yeah that just curates your a positive experience i don't even want my staff to sell i just want to make sure that you have a smile throughout the whole process because not everybody that walks in my doors needs to buy something wow i need promoters of the brand promoters of the brand are made by a positive experience not mm. not me grabbing you by the ankles and taking every little coin you got in your, you know, in your yeah. pocket. No, I love that, man. Cause the first time I didn't buy anything, but no one pressured me. No one even came up to me to try to sell me. Second time I bought something. And now I just come back for fun, honestly, cause it's so cool in there. Then we did our job. Yeah. No, you provide a great customer experience. Cause there's certain stores you walk in and someone's up your ass. It's like very elitist and it's very like, I don't trust, right? Yeah. And it's like, it's frustrating because I mean, we're in a timepieces. Everybody's in a timepieces now, right? You walk into one of those, you know you got the money for what you're about to ask for. Yeah. And it's the same repetitive experience. I don't got anything. Got to get on yeah, the way. They want to talk to you. Da, 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 da. It's like, why is that really helping your brand? Not at all. And they have it in the back too. <laughs> yeah, there's an allocation that's based off. I mean, if we're going to spill the beans, let's spill the beans, right? <laughs> there's an allocation that's provided at every store. It's based off a of seniority of the amount of reps that they have. Good. So if you and I come into the store and we get the same sales rep and you ask for a timepiece that's not allotted to them, they're not even going to entertain their conversation. And then if you're only asking for one, they really don't have an interest. They're mm. trying to build the next 20 years of clientele, right? That means repetition, multiple. Yeah. So if you're not in there throwing on the wall, asking for a whole bunch of them, you're probably not going to get any of them, yeah. right? And the other part is, is these brands are asking these clients to wait at least two to three weeks before that rep actually gives you one mm. unless you got somebody that cares right you know so that's no really it's tough. crazy man it's a I, whole it's a racket yeah no i've walked in the rolex store in like sweatpants and hoodies and they won't even talk to me i that i i love not looking the part and, yeah and then being the part <laughs> i i live for that but i have some great relationships because i listen a lot and then i i i attack where your opening is and right I've been very fortunate. I mean, I'm persistent, right? Um, not a not a boasting statement, but I hoard. And, you know, I 31, 31 time pieces in two years. Yeah. Yeah, I'm up to five. I got to get like you, man. I, I mean, you're. I think you're going to be there a lot more efficiently than I ever was. <laughs> oh, man, I love your story for real. It's, it's really inspiring, honestly. Thank you, brother. Yeah, not Thank a lot you. of people go from homelessness to... I wasn't, you know, I... I allowed myself to get into a space um, where I, I just, you know, I was really young. I was in my 20s, didn't have habits. I'd messed up a few times being a knucklehead as a kid. And I just didn't want to ask my parents, hey, can you, can you bail me out of this one again? Mm. Like at, at, at 23, 24 years old, I'm, I'm now looking at the other foot. Man, what has my mom gone through? Can she really, like, does she really deserve to have to bail me out again? Like, I, mm. I should probably figure it out this time. Oh, so you didn't even tell them? Yeah, I would tell everybody I was good. Like, oh, wow. you know, and, and uh, I would call back home, check in. Hey, how are things? Yep, we're great. Wow. You know, but I'm really sleeping in parks and, you know, showering in fountains. And, <laughs> you know, like, I, I, once you, you know, I, I replayed a lot of moments and uh, that didn't work out in my way or in the way that I ideally wanted to. 
and there was a common denominator and, uh, and there was a few common denominators one was me mm. the other one was my attitude and then my selfishness right and so when i pretty much got it together sorry got it together and then lost it all again because mm. i didn't really have any rules like, re like i just i was very reckless right i was just uh i i looked at everything and i said man if i get the opportunity maybe i'm just going to start focusing on everybody else mm. So it's like a switch. Put, yeah. And at first it felt very uncomfortable. Right. Um, at first I didn't really understand how to do that. Like very foot and mouth felt weird. And then as I started growing, you know, I was very scared to tell my story. And then I felt very uncomfortable that I wasn't telling my story. Mm. And as the brand started growing, that's when I started kind of telling my story. And it's more because there's a million people like me that want to do exactly what I'm doing, if not bigger, mm. that possibly could. And all they need is somebody to tell them, get off your backside and go get it. Wow. What was that first breakthrough for you? Was it someone taking you on? Was it alone? Was it, do you remember a specific um, moment? I mean, there's so many moments uh, that I think helped me look at my brand and say, I think you're on to something. Um, I think one of the most, one of the biggest bursts that it gave me a boost of confidence with the brand was, um, about six, seven months into my brand, um, I came across another, uh, a buddy that I had met earlier. Like when I started my business, I, I, the day I signed my lease, I had, uh, I have $40 to my name. Wow. Right? Like I signed my business license. I got a credit card for 2,400 bucks. I opened up in a 500 square foot location. Yeah. No neighbors first six months. Uh, I, I kind of sublet when I wasn't supposed to, but yeah, I yeah. charged it as marketing. <laughs> um, you know, and I made a post it was like, Hey man, I'm going to be opening something that I think is going to be very different. If you guys want to get a first hand look, like come down. Mm. And this was before the store was open. Reality was I didn't know how to paint. I didn't know how to put shelves up. <laughs> I was just looking for help all sorts of ways. Right. Yeah. Came across this guy, had a great conversation. He was like, hey, I don't feel well. I'll, I'll, I'll be back later. And I you know, thanked him for his time. Months passed, six months to be exact. Comes back, he's like a shell of himself. Hmm. And I'm like, dude, what happened? He's like, look, I'm a little under the weather. I, I need to get a heart transplant. You know, and goes down this whole spiel of how like he has to try to raise money to be able to get into a program out in San Diego so he could get on the list to get a heart transplant. I'm like, all right, so what do you need? What are we doing? He's like, well, I, I started a GoFund. You know, the typical route that you yeah, try yeah. to do to generate money. I'm like, well, how much have you raised? He's like, you know, a couple hundred bucks. I'm like, who's helping you? He's like, I'm like, where's the family? He's like, none. Mm. So it hurt to hear that, right? And so I'm telling my wife, we got to help this guy. We got to figure out a way to help this guy. So this was around the, the Manny Pacquiao Mayweather fight. Yeah. And I'm a consignment shop, right? So at the time, I really don't own anything. Right. I don't really have anything. I'm, this is six months into my it's six months into the brand. Um, so the way consignment works at the time, and for most part, is you sell something, you hold on to the money, money, and then there's a time period when you pay it out, right? At that time, we were quick with it. It was like a week. Yeah. Now there's so many layers to protect consumer, customer, consigner alike, right? So it takes a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, I'm trying for months to get this uh, the tickets to the fight. I have boxers telling me, hey, we're going to give you tickets. Don't worry about it. This is a great reason why. But money's involved and people are reselling the tickets and it's just not working out. Right. So the Wednesday night before the fight, I asked my wife, how much money do we have? Mm. And we have six grand in the business bank account, but on Monday, checks need to be cut and go out right. for most of that money. So I'm sitting here like, all right, I don't have anything I could sell. We only got six grand. You know what? Give me the six grand. I'm going to buy two tickets that I could then do a raffle. I'll figure it out. And if look, if we upset some consigners because we weren't able to pay them out, reality is we don't need them as consigners. If they can't have a heart like they, I should. I don't need to be making money for anybody. So she was a little concerned, rightfully so. I'm literally risking my business for a guy that I don't even know. Wow. Off of one, two interactions. I buy these tickets Wednesday night. I somehow get on the news Thursday. Um, I did what we had to do. Wow. Uh, I got that six thousand back. I got fifteen thousand for a guy that needed ten thousand. Um, the guy that won the tickets 
then sold the tickets to then send his mom on vacation. So it was like the gift I kept giving. And at that time, I'm like, man, I did that out of nothing. Yeah. I did that out of thin air. So if I could do that with just a simple thought on, you know, like a 48 hour window, like what else can I do? Mm. And that was like the first real empowering moment with my brand that like I knew I had something that was different. Wow. And we've from there on, we've probably paid for like nine or 10 funerals. We gave a car away. We've and I don't have a, you know, a nonprofit. This is just a, a husband and wife that feel like, hey, I think we could do this. Let's pull it off and let's go. That's insane, man. You saved the guy's life with no money. That's an incredible story. Why wouldn't you if you could? Yeah, that's so inspiring. Wow. And you don't even do it for the write off. You just do it. I could care less. Yeah. Because most people just do it as like a charity write off. I don't really, not wired that way. Yeah. There's a lot I got to learn from a business standpoint. I'd be the first one to tell you, but but my intentions aren't to get a tax break. If mm. I got to pay the number, whatever it is, I'm paying, I'm overpaying, I'm underpaying. Like I'm learning, but I'm having fun and I'm helping. Yeah. And that's all I care about. I don't care about the dollar. I never have. Wow. So money's just not even on your mind. At all. Wow. Why? Because I mean, look, at some point I'll probably have a hundred locations. At some point I'll have enough layers that my brand is going to do all the work for me. And they're just going to say, here you go, boss, mm. you know, and, and, and I'll have the resources to go and move in any direction. But my impact of where I'm still connected in the limelight like this, my window is very short. Mm. So I have to really, I, I'm focused on legacy, right? Right. I'm focused on generational and that doesn't always require a dollar. Mm. You're thinking the long-term game. You're not thinking no, about making a quick buck. No, I'm thinking way past anything that I'll ever be able to see myself. Wow. You got kids yet? I have a 20-year-old. Oh, congrats. Yeah. 20 she's, years old. Yeah, she's uh, going to be a junior in college. Um, she has my work ethic. She is not consumed in hoarding like I am, which <laughs> I am very thankful for, um, you know. Same thing as the previous guest that I heard when I was walking in, you know, uh, I, I told her, I'll make you a deal, save some money, I'll, I'll, I'll match it. Yeah. She got her first car. She paid half. I paid half. Nice. You know, it wasn't it wasn't the little two hundred fifty dollar Honda Accord I had <laughs> when I started, you know, yeah. but um, times have changed and I'm really proud of her. She's got my work ethic and she's going to be way greater than I ever could be. Do you want to pass the torch to her? I don't think she wants it. There was a moment where she was like, hey, dad, I'll, I, I want to do this. Let me I'm going to take over the business. And then she kind of became my worst employee. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. She very uh, she's not enough experience. Right. And in, in, in human interaction. And she's very foot and mouth like I was as a kid. But I, okay. I, uh, I think that when she finds what she wants to do, she's going to be exceptional at it. Yeah. She's going to have all the tools and resources to do whatever it is that she wants. Love that. Man, what's next for you? Anything you're trying to promote? Uh, no, I think for me, it's just uh, being a better person than I was yesterday. Probably having a few more local. I know we have like seven LOIs in place from now to the end of next year. But, um, you know, we we want to kind of have 20 doors in the next three years. I think 100 doors in the, in the next 10. I, I don't think it's going to take that long, but that's kind of what's on the board. And, yeah. and uh, just continuing to raise the expectations of what your retail experience should be. You're about to take over, man. I can't wait to see <laughs> the empire grow. Yeah, I'm excited, man. man. I really appreciate your time, dude. Absolutely, man. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time. Take care.